And to give you a more concrete example, so uh, here in the schematic, we have two brain regions, A and B. A is connected to B with a time delay of 20 milliseconds. Now, if the sleep spindles, the population activity in both regions uh, are synchronized, as uh, indicated by the graph here, then uh, the spikes, which are usually locked to the more excitable state of spindles, would occur simultaneously. However, because of the time delay between region A and B, the spiking activity in region A would only occur a couple of milliseconds later uh, in region B and elicit uh, excitatory postsynaptic uh, potential. So uh, because of this timing uh, relationship and timing, this might uh, lead to synaptic depression or no changes at all. So considering the same situation with a rotating wave, as uh, we have found in these people with epilepsy, um, the rotating wave would lead to a shift between those oscillations. Again, the more excitable states of these waves would time lock uh, spiking activity, but this time, because of the shift in time, we see that the spiking activity from region A arrives a couple of milliseconds later again in region B, but this time the spikes, uh, spiking activity occurs in region B simultaneously with the postsynaptic potential, and thus this mechanism can lead to association between the areas due to synaptic uh, potentiation. So uh, in summary, in this study, we hypothesized that uh, traveling waves could mediate spike timing dependent plasticity in memory processes. So overall, we uh, have found that cortical traveling waves are ubiquitous throughout the brain. They have a significant role in uh, certain processes such as memory and in visual perception, as well as information transfer in the motor cortex. And there are many other studies that have investigated their function and have found them throughout the cortex. And uh, next, I want to talk uh, basically about the main topic of this lecture, which are mechanisms of cortical traveling waves. But first, I think it makes sense to actually discuss what mechanisms are. And uh, maybe you can recall from uh, Micha's talk that he has shown you uh, several different definitions uh, depending on the perspective that people chose. So uh, I already disclaim yeah, there is definitely no uh, uncontroversial definition of uh, mechanism. However, uh, to work with something, I have chosen this one, which is a very broad definition by Hilary and Williamson, which says that a mechanism for a phenomenon consists of entities and activities organized in such a way that they are responsible for the phenomenon. Now, entities are the parts or part, uh, component parts. Activities could be interactions and uh, component operations. And um, <clears throat> so to basically identify a mechanism or understand a, a phenomenon, we have to decompose the phenomenon into entities and activities. Um, okay, so what is the mechanism underlying ocean surface waves? And in particular, if you look at wind-driven wave, uh, surface waves, uh, it is typically thought to be the wind that blows across the surface of the ocean. And um, as you can see in this background video, the, the waves actually propagate towards the shore along the wind direction. Uh, now, if we want to decompose this phenomenon of wind-driven surface waves, what would be the entities and activities? Um, I guess currents can be a part of that if we're not looking at wind-driven waves. Uh, so that's a good suggestion for ocean waves in general. Um, however, in this mechanism, I would say it is uh, the entities would be air molecules and water molecules, and uh, the activities would be the motion of the air as well as the interaction between the water and air molecules um, through uh, friction and um, pressure. And, but if we look at this more closely, we also have to look at different scales. So, um, just briefly, because um, this is not a talk about ocean surface waves, but briefly, uh, atmospheric fluctuations in pressure, so turbulence in the atmosphere actually uh, causes uh, ripples on the, on the resting surface, which results in so-called capillary waves. And these small-scale waves are then um, 
um, grown or developed into larger waves by the wind. And this involves a second mechanism that results in a phenomenon called sheltering, where uh, pressure differences are created on the leeward and on the windward side of these waves, and those differences then grow these waves further and so on. So this is all to say that uh, mechanisms are difficult to understand, and it often depends on the scale. And I found in a recent article on uh, Physics Today, where they talk about how does the wind generate waves, they actually conclude that the details of how wind transfers energy to waves at the ocean surface remain elusive. So again, it is not easy to understand these mechanisms and not even for a seemingly simple phenomenon such as ocean surface waves. Okay, and before we jump to neural waves, I want to clarify a term that I have already used a little bit, which is the phase. So the phase is basically a designator of where we are in the cycle of a periodic function. So here we're looking at the periodic function, namely the familiar sine wave. And uh, what is drawn here is one cycle of such a sine wave. And to better talk about where we are in this cycle, we use uh, the so-called phase. And the phase is usually defined in degrees or radians. And in degrees, we talk about uh, uh, a phase from zero to 360 degrees. So if we say we're at 180 degrees, then we're at the trough of the sine wave cycle. All right. And to put this into context, again, in neuroscience, here again, you see an ECOG array that was projected onto this 3D reconstruction, and this is an average relative phase. So you see how the phase uh, increases from uh, the top right to the bottom left. And the systematic change of a phase is usually an indicator of a traveling wave, which is uh, at the direction is indicated with this arrow here. So when the authors of this study averaged the waveform along this uh, propagation direction, they got these uh, waveforms down here, that, and you can see they are systematically phase shifted to each other, indicative of a traveling wave. Now let's look at those mechanisms. So there are three uh, main mechanisms that drive neural traveling waves, and um, as you already suggested, um, here the entities are illustrated with a black open circle. These could be any sort of excitable media, such as neurons or, um, or populations of neurons even. And here we have another entity with this um, sine curve uh, that suggests this is an oscillator. Um, could be a neural population, could also be a neuron. So neurons can also be oscillators. They have much more complicated periodic functions though. And in this first mechanism, which is called delayed excitations from a single oscillator, uh, we have uh, one um, self-oscillating entity that successively excites uh, these entities on top here by uh, increasing time delays. So this uh, results in something called an apparent wave, which is usually not considered a real wave. Uh, but it does produce the phenomenon of a wave. And the phase shift between these entities can be described with this form, uh, simple formula. So delta psi is the phase shift between the successive entities. It's equal to two pi times nu, which is the oscillation frequency times delta tau d, the time delay. And of course, we also have connections as someone suggested, connectivity is important. And uh, this mechanism has been shown to be the driver of um, current discharges along the length of electric eel, so the aquatic animal. In a second mechanism, we have propagating pulses in an excitable network. So here you would again have a, a single oscillator that excites the neighboring entity, and, and this one excites the neighboring entity, and this one excites its neighbor in turn, vi again via uh, conduction delays, delta tau d. Uh, so here the activity propagates a, a pulse through the network, and again the phase shift can be described with the same formula as above. And this is hypothesized to underlie, for example, the ictal wavefront in epilepsy, as well as uh, the propagation of slow waves during sleep. 
And the last mechanism is so-called phase-locked uh, phase uh, weakly coupled oscillators. And this time, all the entities are self-oscillating, as you can see indicated here by the red sine wave in each of the black circles. And they are recurrently connected with uh, some sort of interaction function, gamma. So uh, the phase shift between those is a little bit more complicated. Uh, but this is an important mechanism because it has been hypothesized to be the primary mechanism underlying uh, all the major brain rhythms from alpha, beta, and gamma waves. And uh, that's also why we're going to have a closer look at this mechanism in specifically. So uh, the weakly coupled oscillator mechanism is based on two main assumptions. The first assumption is that we have, as we already saw, um, self-oscillating entities. And this is here shown with a fast spiking model neuron. So we see the, pro the, the membrane potential that is repeatedly uh, showing spiking activity. So this is a more complicated periodic function. And as already said, we can um, um, uh, kind of relate this periodic function to its phase. So down here, we see the phase, which starts here at the spike. We increase through a cycle to the next spike, then we jump down and increase through the next cycle, and so on and so forth. So the first assumption is we have uh, self-oscillating entities. The second assumption is that these oscillators are weakly coupled. And when I say weakly coupled, I mean that they do not disturb their uh, limit cycle or um, the, the, basically the shape of the, of the oscillation or their amplitude. And this again is illustrated here with the membrane potential of this fast spiking model neuron. So down here in blue, you see a stimulus that is uh, injected into this neuron at about 60 milliseconds. And uh, the da dashed line represents the changed uh, timing of this oscillation. So the shape is not changed, but the timing of the limit cycle can be changed. And in this case, you see a phase advance from its original cycle um, to an earlier or shorter cycle. And uh, below here, if you inject this current, current at uh, all of the phases of the cycle, you can uh, actually find something called the phase response curve. So again, if we look at this 60 millisecond, um, injected stimulus would get almost the largest phase response and in this case a phase advance. If we would have injected the stimulus at a millisecond 40, there would be almost no change in the phase. So uh, we can actually derive this phase uh, response curve experimentally and further use it to derive a weakly coupled oscillator model a, uh, by phase reduction and then end up having a phase model. And if you are interested in the details of how to do that, I can highly recommend this paper by Bart Ehrmantraut and David Kleinfeld, which uh, talks you through, through how this is done for a neuron. And uh, in general, if you're interested in traveling waste, this is a very good uh, starting point.